Yeah, not too bad today. He said, don't run off the better. That's my page. You want to put his? Well, I just turned it on. I just turned it on. Just so. الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك بمحمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So I think this time I think we have everything working. Last time we didn't have the uh, the live feed. I think everybody's connected now. طيب. So let's look at what we're going to look at tonight. But before we do that, I actually have two housekeeping items. The first item is that, as you guys can all see, uh, the prayer is getting later and later, which means that it's going to get you out later and later. And we are uh, keen to make sure that we get in and we get out you know, in a time where you can get home, be with your families, and it's not very late. And I think Mother of next week will be right around 6 p.m., which will put our start time about 6.15, 6.20, and get us out of here with the offering of Salat al-Isha around 7.30. So I am inclined uh, to move the time starting from next week to between Mother and Isha. So that would put us, like I said, we come Mother at about 6 o'clock, get started about 6.15, 6.20, and be done with the praying or the offering of Salat al Isha. It'll begin next week, which should be February the 7th, if I'm not mistaken, inshallah. Uh, the second uh, housekeeping item is I need a timekeeper. And we'll set the time for 35 minutes. We'll go for 35 minutes. Hopefully we'll complete, this evening, we'll complete the introduction. And we'll begin the book uh, next week, in the Lahi Ta'ala. So today what we're going to look at is the categories of a shirk minutes, counting down. and how do we distinguish between the categories. The second item on our agenda is a discussion, a brief discussion of the attempts to discredit the author and his work. Number three, we're going to talk a little bit about Kitab al-Tawheed and what we're going to learn, the themes that it addresses and some of the things we're going to learn from the book, what it covers. And last but not least, what to expect next week, inshallah ta'ala. So let's get right to it. There are two categories of a shirk. A shirk, an asghar, minor polytheism, minor idolatry. And a shirk, an akbar. Major polytheism or major idolatry. And the proof that there are two categories of a shirk is the hadith collected by Ahmed on the authority of Mahmud 
Ibn Labid, in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam he said, Inna akhwafu ma akhwafu alaykum al-shirk al He said, indeed, what I fear for you the most is the minor shirk, the lesser form of polytheism, the lesser form of idolatry. And he mentioned an example of it, ar ostentation. Now, I want to ask you all a question. We said that a shirk that there are two categories of shirk, minor and major. Then we brought the hadith as a proof of Mahmud ibn Labid, in which the Prophet mentioned, how many forms of shirk did he mention? One. He mentioned one. Mawashu Dilala, how does this hadith prove that there's actually two categories, two categories, major and minor? Because he specified the minor. Because he said minor, okay, expand on that. You're, 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 you're in the right direction, Habib. Expand on that. Because it says most. So if it's the most, then that indicates that there's another type. Mm, no, Habib was, was in the right, right direction. He said, he mentioned minor. What I fear for you the most is the minor shirk. Because when it implies that there's a, a major. It implies. I said there's something uh, called mafhum at taqsim. Mafhum at taqsim. What that means is, is what is indicated or alluded to by the forming of a category or by the description of something in categories and mentioning one, mentioning one of the categories. That when the Prophet says, what I fear for you the most is minor shirk, then there has to be what? Major. A major shirk, otherwise the word minor wouldn't make, it wouldn't make any sense, would it? Mm -hmm. Imagine that you came to my home, and there's a little girl that comes bouncing down the steps. And I say, here comes my youngest daughter. And then you ask me, well, how many, how many daughters do you have? And I say, just the one. Would that make sense? Why would you even ask me how many daughters that you have? Because just by me saying the youngest implies that there must be an oldest. An oldest. You guys see that? Or at least an older one. So when the Prophet ﷺ said, I fear for you the most, the minor shirk, then there, must, there has to be my yuqabilu humin, min akbar. There has to be the opposite, which is the major shirk. You guys see that? I think a better thing would be the smaller or the, like, it's kind of, like, it's a language difference. In Arabic, it's very clear mm -hmm. that, like, al other means the smaller kind of, right? Right, the smaller or the lesser or, or the, the lesser. minor. Yeah. But yeah. at the end of the day, if there, it, all of those means that there has to be what? Yeah. There has to be a counterpart. Yeah. That it, by, 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 by mentioning one part or one category that has to have a counterpart, it indicates that there's a counterpart. That's what I'm trying to say. Ah, it's fellowship. What does it mean in Arabic? Arriya? How would you say it in English? No. What does it mean? It means to write. It means to write. It means to write. You read and write. You read and write. If you write and write, you read and write. Arriya. Arriya. From Ara, you read. From Ara, you read. Arriya. Arriya. Ara, you read. So you have Ra'a, Yara. Then you have Ara, Yuri. La. Ra'a is the first uh, means that he saw. But Ara, Yuri is he made somebody else see. He wanted to be seen. Is it Yuri or Yuri? Huh? It's Yuri, right? I don't, is it? Ah, you, you might be right. Yeah, because it's Riyah Ahsant. So yeah, it should be Ra'a Yuri Ahsant. You're right, you're right. You're absolutely right. Because of the Mustar, Riyah. Yeah. So it's like Jahada Yujahidu Jihada. Ahsant. Sahib Lurash. Not really, but. 
طيب الحمد لله. All right. So now how do we distinguish the two? Uh, how do we distinguish the two categories? We said there's minor and there's major. What's the difference between the two? The first thing, the first thing that we always have to remember, as we talked about last week toward the end of the lesson, is that whenever you have, whenever we're talking about the shirk, we're talking about a tesbiyah. We're talking about equating. But there's a difference in the equating, which makes one form of this tasuya, one form of this equating major shift, and one that makes it minor. So, in the case of a shirk al akbar, who is shirk al the major polytheism is an equating of Allah with others, which involves or is influenced by belief. A person actually believing that something or someone is equal to Allah in something. While the minor polytheism is also a tesmiya, it is also an equating, but it is an equating that is articulated but not necessarily believed. A person says something, which when you hear it, it gives the impression that he thinks something or someone is equal to Allah. But he doesn't really believe that in his heart. Like for example, in Halif, Allah. A person swears by Adhan Allah. Or a person says something which seems or gives the indication that he's putting someone or something on equal footing or on par with Allah. But sometimes the taswiya isn't obvious. It's vague. It's hard to perceive. And that's why the scholars have also said when it comes to a shirk al asghar we can also say it's any act which has been referred to in religious texts as a shirk but does not reach the level of major polytheism. Because there are a few examples where Allah, where Allah or His Messenger have called something a shirk and it's not clear where the tasbih is. But the sharia, Allah, or the shari, Allah has the right to say something is what? A shirk. And if he says it's a shirk, we have to what? We have to accept that. So these are the two definitions for minor shirk. Either it's just what? A shirk for love. It's a shirk which is articulated but not necessarily believed. Or it's something which the sharia has called shirk but does not reach to the level of major, major shirk. What are some examples? One example is this hadith, or can be found in this hadith, let's by Bukhari fil Adib al Mufrad on the authority of the Abbas, in which he mentions that a man said to the Prophet, Masha'Allahu wa shi'at. He said, What Allah wills, and you will. Now, when he says that, when you hear it, it sounds like what? The will of the Prophet and the will of Allah are on the same one, on the same plane. What Allah wills and what you will. So the Prophet said, Aja'altani lillahi niddan, have you made me a rival and equal to Allah? Say, Masha'Allahu wahda. Say what Allah wills, and that's it. In another hadith which is similar to this, collected by Nasa'i wa ta'ala, on the authority of Qutayla, a Jewish man came to the Prophet and said, You people, are good people, except that you, he said, to nadiduna, wa tushrikun. He said, you make rivals with Allah, and you commit shirk, you associate partners with Allah. He went on to explain. He said, to nadidun, taquluna wal ka'bah. He said, you make rivals with Allah by saying. I swear by the Kaaba. What to shrikuna be pawnikum, masha'allahu wa shita. And he said, you associate partners with Allah by saying what you will, I'm sorry, what Allah wills and what you will. So after that, the Prophet, he ordered the people, if they swore, to say what up the Kaaba, 
to say, I swear by the Lord of the Kaaba, not I swear by the Kaaba. And he told him to say, Masha'Allahu, thumma shi'ta. What you will, and then, I'm sorry, what Allah wills, and then what you will. Putting what? Putting Allah on a plane, and others on a plane lower than the plane of Allah. Not on the same, not on the same plane. So this is one, or we mentioned one distinguishing characteristic. That major shirk is shirkun fil i'tiqad. It's something that you believe. Minor shirk is something fil laf. It's something that you say but don't necessarily believe. When a person says what Allah wills and you will, they don't believe that you're equal to Allah. They said something which indicates that, but they really don't believe it. Tayyip, let's look at some other distinguishing characteristics. One is that major shirk, it nullifies faith. When a person commits major shirk, they become a disbeliever and leave the fold of Islam. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, All of your deeds become null and void and you become amongst the losers. The word khusran in the Quran, as um, Al-Asfahan mentioned, it's only used for spiritual loss. It's only used for people who have become disbelievers and have therefore lost the opportunity to be saved or attain salvation thereafter. So major shirk, it nullifies faith and removes a person from the fold of Islam. But minor shirk does not nullify faith, but diminishes it like other sins. As Ibn Qayyim mentioned, he said, Bil ijma. The scholars of Islam are agreed that the one who commits minor shirk has not become a disbeliever. The proof from the distinguishing characteristics is that a shirk, major shirk it is, I'm sorry, is an unforgivable sin. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Nisa, the fourth chapter, verse number 48, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرْ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ An unforgivable sin, Allah does not forgive the sin of a shirk. And I want you to pay attention to something. The scholars of Islam have mentioned that al asl the original rule, the standard, is that when Allah mentions a shirk in the Qur'an, what's intended is the major shirk. That's what's intended. That's the asl. So when Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرْ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِي أَيْ شِرْكٍ أَكْبَرٍ He says, Allah does not forgive that you commit major shirk. وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكْ أَيْ and Allah will forgive minor shirk and other sins, and it's forgivable. That's the difference between major and minor, minor shirk. From the differences or distinguishing characteristics, is that major shirk, it nullifies all good deeds. As we read the verse from Surah Az-Zumar, verse number, the, the 39th chapter, verse number 65, la your deeds, if you commit shirk, your deeds will be null and void. And you'll be from the losers. Whereas minor shirk, does it nullify all of your deeds? If a person came to the masjid and he saw some people and he wanted to impress them, so he started praying, a very long prayer. And he, wanted, he was doing that with the intention of making them think he was pious. Will it nullify all of his other deeds? No, it'll nullify that one deed, and the proof for that is the hadith, the hadith collected by Muslim on the Torah of the Hurairah, in which the Prophet ﷺ, he said that Allah says, أَنَا أَذْنَ الشُّرَكَاءِ أَنَا الشِّرْكِ مَنَ عَمِلَ عَمَلًا لَيْسَ I'm sorry, مَنَ عَمِلَ عَمَلًا أَشْرَكَ فِيهِ مَا يَغَيْرِي تَرَكْتُهُ وَشِرْكَ He said, I am the least in need of a rival or a partner or a peer or an associate. Whoever does a deed and associates others with me in that deed, I will abandon him and his shirk. I will abandon him and that deed that he did for the sake of others, but not all of his deeds. But last but not least, and these are not the, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's just a few distinguishing characteristics. Last but not least on this list is that major shirk requires eternal punishment in hell. People who die upon major shirk will reside in hell forever, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. <laughs> he says, indeed, those who disbelieve amongst the polytheists and the people of the book, 
will reside in hell forever. Uh, they are the worst of created beings. He also says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, the 72nd verse of Surah Al-Ma'idah, the 5th chapter, he says, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَأْوَاهُ النَّارُ مَا لِلْظَالِمِينَ مِنْ مِنْ أَنْصَارِ He says, indeed, whoever commits shirk with Allah, and again we said the asal, the original rule, when the, the word shirk is mentioned in the Quran, it's talking about major shirk. Whoever does that, commits a shirk with Allah, then Allah has prohibited for him paradise, and his abode will be the hellfire. Whereas, minor shirk, if Allah chooses to punish a person who commits it, the punishment will be for a term determined by Allah, and that person will ultimately succeed. And Ibn Al-Qaybi mentioned in his book, Iraq al Ahfan, he said that the scholars of Islam are in agreement, unanimously agreed, that the one who commits a shirk of asghar is not included in the verse where Allah says, Inna That paradise will be prohibited for him. They agree that that verse doesn't apply to the person who commits minor shirk. They also agreed that, that the verse where Allah says, That your deeds will be rendered vain does not apply to the people who commit minor shirk. So these are some of the differences. Next up on our docket is the attempts to discredit the author. And we need to talk about this because we're going to be studying his work. And we need to study it and be confident that the book that we're studying is a credible work. That there is academic and Islamic and spiritual benefit in this book and that there is nothing that is dangerous or harmful to our faith or to our beliefs or to our theology in this book. We have to have confidence in that. And so we need to kind of address the elephant in the room, and that is some of the attacks and the attempts to discredit the author. Now before I begin talking about some of those attacks, I want to mention that one of the common tactics of the people of falsehood, to stop the spread of truth and discourage people from giving credence to the truth. One of their common tactics is to call the people of truth and the truth itself be al qabin tanfiriya. They call them by these names which are called pejorative, we could call them pejoratives, or basically a name, the intention of it is to fill people with aversion, fill, fill them with hatred, fill them with enmity aversion and disgust toward the truth and toward the people who call to the truth. And this is something very common, we're going to see some examples of it shortly. So for example, the Prophet Muhammad when he first came, calling the pagans of Mecca to a tawheed and to the truth. What was his message? His message was, He told him, he said, just say, embrace La ilaha illallah. There is no deity worthy of worship except Allah, and you'll be successful. You'll attain salvation. That's what it, that was his message. Very simple message. And they began this campaign to discredit him by calling him names. And so they started calling him, instead of calling him Muhammad, praiseworthy, they started calling him Mudammam. They started calling him blameworthy, the opposite of his name. And sometimes they would say, because people were starting to accept his message. And they were starting to lend him an ear. Even if they didn't accept, they would listen. So they started to say that he was a magician, and that he used his sorcery to charm people into believing that what he was saying was true. They started calling him a sorcerer sometimes. Other times they would actually say that he was bewitched. He was the victim or afflicted by magic. That basically... Don't go and listen to him because there's a spell that's been cast upon him by an evil magician, right? And this is something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in the Qur'an itself. So he says in Surah Al-Isra, the 17th, verse, 17th chapter, I'm sorry, verses number 47 and 48, he says, نَحْنُ أَعْلَمْ بِمَا يَسْتَمِعُونَ بِهِ إِذْ يَسْتَمِعُونَ إِلَيْكَ وَيْذْهُمْ نَجْوَىٰ إِذْ يَقُولُ الظَّالِمُونَ إِن تَتَّبِعُونَ إِلَّا رَجُلًا so Allah, he says, we know best 
how they listen to your recitation when you recite. And what they say privately when those wrongdoers say, you people follow none but a man bewitched. See how they call you, O prophet, names unbecoming your true status, and go astray thereby, and cannot therefore find the right path. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran talks about how they used to criticize the prophet and try to convince people not to follow him by calling him names. Because people don't want to follow someone that they think is crazy or bewitched or someone they think is going to bewitch them. And so they would use this as a tactic or a means to discourage people to listen to them. To the point that some people would come to Mecca and they would stuff cotton in their ears so they wouldn't hear his message because of what they had been told about the Prophet ﷺ. And this is not something which is unique to the Prophet ﷺ. There are even other examples of this. So for example, one of the examples is the other Prophets. So for example, read the Qur'an, you'll see how the Aqwam, the communities of the Prophets, they would use the same tactic. So for example, when Nuh came to his people, and he called them to truth, he called them to a Tawheed. They said, uh, They said, we feel, or it is our uh, perception, that you are clearly misguided. That you are someone who misguided, is you're misguided and you misguide others. And they said about Hud, they said about him, they say, uh, they said, Inna lanadhunnuka fi dalaq fi safahatin, wa inna lanadhunnuka mil kathibin. They said that we consider you a fool, they called him, and they said we also consider you a liar. Musa, alayhi salam, he also did not escape this. So when he came to Fir'aun with the truth, Fir'aun, he said, Am ana khayru min hadha ladhi huwa muheen, wa la yakadu yubeen. He said, Am I not superior to this one who's a nobody? Call him a nobody. Wa la yakadu yubeen. And he's unable to what? To, to make himself understood when he speaks. He criticized his speech impediment. You guys see that? Why do you want to listen to someone who can't even what? Articulate. That's what he said. And he also said, in another part of the Qur'an, he said, uh, he said, وَإِنِّي لَأَذُنُّكَ يَا مُوسَى مَسْحُورًا He said, indeed, Moses, it's clear to me that you are bewitched. The same thing they call the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. But it doesn't stop with the Prophets either, brothers. Brothers and sisters. Even the scholars throughout history and even in recent times, they have also, whenever they've said something or done something that made people upset or people didn't like it and they wanted to discredit them, they would discredit them by calling them names. So one of the greatest scholars of our time is a sheikh and imam Muhammad Nasruddin al-Bani. And he is the one who has revived uh, the science of uh, checking a hadith and researching them and clarifying or distinguishing the authentic hadith from those which are not authentic. And also being a person who puts the hadith front and center when attempting to determine what is true Islam versus what is false Islam. So when he did that, a lot of the people who blindly follow the madahib and really belittle the importance of following the hadith and will even follow their madhab, their school of thought, if it contradicts uh, the clear meaning of the hadith, they'll ignore the hadith and follow the madhab. They didn't like what he was saying and what he was doing and how he was, in their mind, undermining the four imams. He wasn't undermining them because they were the people who said, if you find a hadith that's authentic, that's my mother. Al-Muhim. So they started saying, are we going to take our religion from a sa'ati? Are we going to take our religion from a watchmaker? Because Al-Bani, before he dedicated his life to studying a hadith, his profession, the way that he earned his money, was by making watches. And this was not just him, but it was something that was a family tradition. And is there anything wrong with being a watchmaker? No. Is it illegal? No. Is it illicit? Is it shameful to, to, to earn a living by making watches? Certainly not. But they saw it as a means to what? To somehow discredit him, delegitimize him and his knowledge. 
And one last example, uh, which is very common, is even political parties. And we see this here in our country, where there are people who basically say that the government has a responsibility to provide social services and to take care of its less fortunate citizens. And people will say about those people who say that, that they are socialists, because the word socialist is considered what? A bad word, and socialism is considered a bad thing, although there's a difference between social programs and socialism. And Mohim, these are just some examples just to show you it's very, very what? Very, very common. This tactic is common and we can't fall for it. And you're going to see it a lot today. You're going to see it. There are people who call to truth. They are sincere. And when they call to truth and they are sincere, they'll be attacked. They'll be called names. And what you have to do, what we all have to do, is when people are called names, we don't just take those names and say, okay, because they were called that name, they're bad, because people say so. No, we have to look beyond that and realize many people are called names, not because they really are bad, but because bad people want to discredit them. But with that said, let's look at some of the most common attacks on Angela. We won't spend a lot of time. But one of them is that they accuse uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and those who are influenced by him or were influenced by him as inventing a fifth madhab and a heretical religion which they call Wahhabiyyah or Wahhabism. So basically they say that the Imam came with a religion or an interpretation of faith which was totally different from that of the four Imams. Another accusation that they make is that his religion, this religion that he bought, this fifth method, is exceptionally rigid and uncompromising and arguably fanatical, especially when it comes to the concept of the Tawheed, the oneness of Allah, a tabarruq, seeking barakah and blessings from things and people, a tawassul, seeking a means of nearness to Allah, and also a shafa'ah, the concept of intercession. So they say they go to extremes in that, and they make it make haram what is halal, etc. But another attack is that they are intolerant of any and all beliefs and practices besides their own. That the only acceptable way to believe or think or understand or practice Islam is how they do it. Even in matters in which difference of opinion are permitted, they don't permit difference of opinion. They're totally intolerant. They also say that they're mujassima. They're the people who anthropomorphize Allah, humanize Him, right? Give Him the attributes of human beings. And they say that, why? Because they affirm what Allah affirmed to Himself in the Quran of things like having a face, which befits His majesty and is not like His creatures, and eyes, which befit His majesty and are not like His creatures, and hands, and so on. All of these attributes, which are similar in name only to the attributes of Allah's Creatures. They call him what? They call him and the people who uh, are influenced by him mujassima. Also, they say that they despise the Prophet. Or at the very least, they don't love him the way they should. They don't respect him as they should. Why? Because they don't celebrate his birthday and they forbid celebrating it and calling it and they call it a bid'ah. So, because of that, they don't love the Prophet uh, because they don't celebrate his birthday. But from Ba'dalik, they say that they have aberrant stances, that their methodology and their uh, stances in religion, they oppose the majority of the Muslims and contradict orthodox views and practices, that basically orthodoxy is here and they're way out one. They're way out here. Okay? And then another example is they are the source of modern Islamic terrorism and terrorist groups. So if you look at groups like ISIS and others, they trace their roots back to the teachings of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. This is, these are the attacks. Now what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to try to rebut each of these attacks. That would take forever and we don't have that kind of time. And that's not why we're here. But what I am going to do is I'm going to have to help us to refocus ourselves on what we're doing here, the work that we're going to study, and help us determine whether or not it's a credible work that's worthy of study and that we should read from and that we can trust. 
So the question I want to ask you is, what are the elements of a credible Islamic work? You have a book in front of you, and you open it, and you start to skim it and scan it or read some of its pages. What are some of the things that you're going to read, and when you read them are going to tell you, yeah, this is a quality Islamic work, this is acceptable Islamic scholarship, versus one, that scholarship of a poor standard, it's not acceptable Islamically, etc. Anybody have any problem Abu Khadija? If everything is according to the Quran and the Sunnah, okay. if there is the, you know, the, then there is no doubt. MashaAllah. Wallahi Jawab Sadiq. That basically if you find an author, you find a compiler who fills his book with Allah said and his messenger said, authentic references and supporting evidence from credible religious sources, that is a sign, indication, that that's a good credible Islamic work that you can, you can take from. And this is supported by the famous hadith, I want to say it's the hadith of Abu Ad-Darda, in which he mentioned that the Prophet Sallallahu he said, فَضْلُ الْعَادِمِ الْعَابِدِ كَفَضْلِ الْبَدْرِ I'm sorry, كَفَضْلِ الْقَمْرِ لَيْلَةِ الْبَدْرِ عَلَى سَعْلِ الْقُوَاكِ He said, the superiority of the skull over the layman, the common worshiper, is like the superiority of the full moon over the rest of the stars. Now how does this prove this point? Because the scholars of Islam, when they studied this hadith, they said that the choice of the Prophet's words is very significant. When he wanted to make this analogy, he used the moon and the stars. The moon, brothers and sisters, what it does, it doesn't have any light of its own. But rather, it does what? It reflects the light of the sun. And likewise, a true scholar, the Prophet is telling us, is the one who reflects and transmits and transfers the light of al wahi the light of the Qur'an and Sunnah. Fills his works with what Allah said, his messenger said, it's understood by the early Muslims, not what I think and what I feel, or what some scholar said who said things which were not founded in Adillah. Or even worse, what some Orientalist, some enemy of Islam said, who studied Islam to what? To destroy it from within, or to refute it, or to confuse the Muslims. No, he's saying, Allah said, and his messenger said. So if you have a book which is filled with ayat Qur'aniyah, Qur'anic verses, wa hadith nabawiyah, authentic prophetic tradition, wa athar salafiyah, the statements of the pious predecessors, وَفَتَاوَ مَوْثُوقَ عِلْمِيَ And legal verdicts, credible legal verdicts from reputable theologians of Islam. If you have a work like that, then you're dealing with a work which is credible. And I challenge anyone to read Kitab al tawheed and say that it contains anything other than that. To the point that the overall majority of the book is ayat, a hadith, Athar, Fatawa from the ulama, and a few statements of the of the alim, Muhammad al Wahhab, where he says, Fihi fawaid. He says there are lessons or benefits to learn from the chapter, and he'll mention some fawaid. Most of it, I would say, two thirds or more of it, is Allah said, His Messenger said, and so on, and very little of it is the statements of the Imam himself, and the statements that he makes are derived from what? From the ayat, the hadith, and not from his own work, from his own opinions and thoughts. But we have about five minutes left and we should be able to wrap up. Let's look at some of the themes of the work and some of the things that we're going to learn and study. Oh, let me actually, I want to mention an anecdote out of, out of city. I want to mention an anecdote. There's a famous anecdote where there was uh, a khatib who used to give uh, sermons and in his sermons, he would mention uh, Muhammad al Wahhab in a very bad way. He would say very bad things about Muhammad ibn al Wahhab. And there was a person who had studied his works and was familiar with him and felt that this person who was saying these things, either he is ignorant, he knows nothing about the Imam, or he's ill informed, 
Because what he's saying is not consistent with what the imam wrote in his works or what is known about the imam. So one day, this person who would listen to his khutbahs took a copy of the book Kitab at tuhid the book that we're going to study. But he took off its covers and all of the references that would indicate that it was written by Muhammad ibn al Wahhab. It's just what? A book with no cover. And he goes to him very politely and humbly and he says, Hey, I, I have this book and I've read it and I think it's very good. But I want to get your opinion because you're so knowledgeable and you know you give such great khutbahs. So would you read this, uh, this, this book and tell me what you think? Do you think it's really good? Because I think it's good. I just want to hear what you think. So he took the book and he read it. And when he met him the next week, he said, Oh, man, this is like one of the best books I've ever read. And he said, That book was written by the Imam that you curse every Friday in Jumu'ah. Al-Muhim, the point is, is that even the enemies of Islam, if they just read the book without knowing who wrote it, they would see that it's just what? Allah said, His Messenger said, it's a credible work and it's very worthy of study because it talks about a very important, the most important subject in Islam in a way that very few people have been able to do in one what? In one work. He really, really was blessed by Allah to put together a work which explains what a Muslim is supposed to believe as it relates to Allah Jalla Jalaluhu wa Adhuma Sultan. Let's look at some of the themes really quick. So the Imam starts out with a series of chapters, a preface, an introduction, if you will, and a series of chapters which outline or highlight the significance of a Tawheed and the danger of its opposite. And he does this to excite us and to get us very interested and to incentivize setting the topic. You're going to benefit so much from this. This is so important. You have to know this. He opens with that. Then after that, he explains what is a Tawheed. He explains it. Then after that, he mentions that from the forms of a shirk is ja'la shay sababan lam yaj'allahu sababan. Making a cause and effect relationship between two things that Allah didn't make a cause and effect relationship between. Goes on. He mentions that from the forms of shirk is often an act of worship to other than Allah, and he gives some examples of that. Then he mentions some chapters where he cuts the roots of idolatrous beliefs and practices. Then after that, he rebuts the spacious arguments, the shubuhat of the idolaters and those who defend them. So basically, people defend the shirk that they do and try to make it Islamic, to paint an Islamic a picture of it. So he refutes that, spends chapters on that. Then after that, he talks about the ruling of sorcery, magic, witchcraft, and other, as he calls them, asbab wahmiya, delusional means, things that people think have an effect, but they don't really have an effect. Then he said, acts which may be devotional acts or non-devotional acts, when are these acts considered shirk? There's some things which can be offered both to Allah and to people and to things. But when they're offered to Allah, they're offered in a certain way and they're only for Allah when they're offered in that way. If they're offered in that way to other than Allah, they become a shirk. How do you distinguish? For example, love. Does a Muslim have to love Allah? Yes. Absolutely. Is loving Allah worship? Yes. Absolutely. In fact, Allah says in this ayah, He says, and from the people are those who take rivals besides Allah that they love them as they should only love Allah. But the people who believe they love Allah more than anything else, in fact, the asl, the foundation of faith, the foundation of ibadah is loving Allah. So that's worship. And can you worship or offer an act of worship to other than Allah? Absolutely not. Can you love your wife? Yeah. Can you love your husband? Can you love your sister, your brother, your mother? Absolutely. So that means love is something that can be offered to Allah and can be offered to others. But when you offer to Allah, you have to offer it a certain way. And that certain way can be offered to others. How do we distinguish? You guys see that? He mentioned some chapters on that. And then he talks about Another important topic, which is governing by other than what Allah has revealed, and so on and so forth throughout the book. He mentions these different topics, which are, if we understand them, and we apply the teachings correctly, we will, avoid, we will achieve a tawheed in our lives, and avoid the opposite, a shirk. But let's close with this, what to expect uh, next week. First of all, I'd like you to read chapters 1 through 5.
That's that first section, which basically incentivizes our learning of Tawheed. And that's about, what, 11 pages. 17 to 38. Pages 17 to 38. Not a lot. Please read through those. And when you read, as you read, read with a thoughtful heart and a thoughtful mind. Maybe you read something and you say, hmm, I wonder what that means. Or I'm not sure what that means. Or does it mean this? I want to ask. Write down those questions, either in the margins or on a separate piece of paper, so that we can, as we comment, we can question and inquire. And that will make our, our, our commentary more fruitful. Then after that, I want, to pay, I want you to pay attention to the fact that we're going to focus in our uh, commentary on issues related to the subject of Tawheed. The book is extremely beneficial beyond a Tawheed. But the, high, the things that we're going to highlight and focus on from the benefits and the commentary are those things that are specific to a Tawheed so that we can be very focused in what we're doing and not be all over the place. If we're going to study a Tawheed, let's focus on what? A Tawheed. And the other benefits, which might distract us from a Tawheed, we'll leave for another, for another class. Any comments? Any questions? Any concerns? Only one. Uh, Abu Khadija. You said that you showed the, the book written of the cowards and everything. Yes, so, yes. So Imam, what he needs to, he needs to start asking forgiveness and, you know, he needs to realize that. But what if he doesn't, for example? What happens? If he doesn't, shame on him because that would indicate uh, that he's uh, stubborn and that would indicate that he is a mutasib, he is fanatical for whatever madhab or whatever party he belongs to. And the Prophet ﷺ warned the people who demonstrate this level of what he called arrogance. He said, He said, the people who have a mustard seed's weight of pride in their hearts will not enter paradise. So a man from the audience, he said, Ya Rasulullah, inna He said, oh, Mr. Allah, but what about the person who likes to wear nice clothes and nice shoes? So the Prophet said, no, 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 that's not pride. What I mean by pride, he specified. He said, He said, pride, the pride that I'm referring to, is rejecting the truth. The truth is right there in front of you. You see it, plain as day. But you choose to what? To ignore it because it came from a source that you don't, you don't like. That's what the Prophet is saying. He said, this is the kibble I'm talking about, which will keep you out of paradise. And looking down upon the people. So definitely the person is putting himself in a very bad uh, situation if he does that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, Habib. Uh, so just from listening to from some of the previous classes and some of the things that uh, constitute shirk, you talking about you put uh, the like someone else on the same level or the, what someone else says or that the, their, their importance equal or above what Allah is saying. Mm -hmm. So so meaning that basically anytime you commit a sin, you're doing something other than what Allah said to say or do. So, yeah. so my question is, can you then say that every sin is a form of shirk? No, because remember, although sin is clearly wrong, and we have lots of indications of that in the Quran and in the Sunnah, um, when we talk about a shirk specifically, we're talking about checking two boxes. The first box is a lechisas or khususiyah, that the thing that you do has to be something or you offer to Allah, and Allah has to be exclusive to Allah. And second is a teswiya, equating. You have to equate something other than Allah with Allah. When a person commits a sin, and some people, they argue like the way you argue, or they make the point that you make. Let's say, for example, a person hears the adhan. They're in their home, and maybe they have one of those like adhan clocks, whatever it is. Or they live close enough to the mosque where they hear the adhan. But they're watching their favorite basketball team in a very tight fourth quarter against their rival and the game could determine first place in the division, or whatever it is, playoff seating. It's like, man, I, I, I just, I can't. I gotta see this game. So, they end up praying in the masjid, and he doesn't, he doesn't go. 
because of the game. Some people will say that this is shirk. But, or they'll say that the person preferred or gave precedence to their love for the game or the love of the team over their love of Allah. But the scholars respond, they say that what happened here is the person doesn't love the game or the team more than they love Allah. But what they did was they preferred athar al-muhabba. They preferred the, 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 the indication of love of one over the other. And they say there's a difference. There's a difference between a person loving the team more than they love Allah or being in a situation where they prefer temporarily one, the not the, not, not the love, but the remnants or the sign or the indication of the love. The indication that you love Allah is that you run to the prayer and leave the game. That's the indication. So in this case, the indication of one was given precedence over the other. That's not the same as preferring one over Allah. You see the difference? So it's a very, very nuanced difference that they, that they point out. And so similarly, sometimes a person wants something that they're not supposed to have. And so they commit a sin, and their desire for that thing takes precedence over their desire to please Allah or their love of Allah. But it's not the actual love itself but it's what they call athar al-muhabba, the sign, the indication of love, that what? That's out of calibration. And so there's a distinct, there's a, a, a slight, but very important difference. And so because of that, the person who sins hasn't committed a shit, but they have done something which is reprehensible because of what you said. You're preferring showing your love for this over showing your love for that. Yeah. Play. Uh, another one. One more thing, real quick. I told them. Um, I know this is uh, this setup is a little bit different because you have a projector than a regular class. Hey. But does this seating arrangement bother you at all? Or are you good with this with people behind you and side of you? No, no. Everything is everything is fine. Everything is fine. Okay. The main thing for me was that people would see the visual aids, and inshallah, uh, ta'ala, next week uh, we'll go back to what we typically would do, which is our visual aid will be the book itself. Uh, and we won't need the slides, but I just felt uh, because these concepts are so important and because they make it easier to explain the book and the concepts may be hard to actually fully uh, comprehend or internalize without the visual aids, that's why we did the slides. But inshallah, next week we'll go back to, to, to business as usual, if you will. So I thank you all for coming. Uh, with the Sheikh's permission, uh, we will uh, do the class between Maghrib and Isha, inshallah, next week. And that will allow us to depart from the masjid with the offering of Salah and Isha. Thank you all for coming. Jazakumullah khairan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak. Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. Uh, yeah, if you want to break down there. How are you doing? I have a question. Sure, sure, absolutely. One of the categories of the people that are shown on the presentation who attacked the 